Good morning. The Lord be with you. We are studying today Matthew uh, chapter 26, verses 47 through 68, uh, all a part of the Passion narrative in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's uh, begin our study today with prayer. God, we offer ourselves to you in the hope that you will teach us and speak to us and renew your life in us that we might live for you and your glory this day and every day. In the strong name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. All right, uh, if you have a Bible, you might want to keep it out uh, and open to uh, Matthew 40, uh, 26, 47 and following. Um, the last session we had ended with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he did not escape to Bethany uh, to avoid arrest. Uh, this is where he and his disciples often, uh, when they were uh, in Jerusalem for these last days, they probably camped out um, on the Mount of Olives, as did hundreds of other people who were in Jerusalem for this Passover festival. Um, as one of the commentators pointed out, we often think of Jesus being alone on the Mount of Olives uh, with his <clears throat> disciples and no one else around. And in fact, it was probably more like a national park with campers everywhere uh, and crowds everywhere. That's likely because uh, there were probably such big crowds hanging around uh, and some sleeping and some having little campfires and whatever everywhere. That's why uh, Judas had said to the soldiers, um, out of all these people that are here on the Mount of Olives, the one that I kiss is the signal for him to be the one you are to arrest. There were so many people, it wouldn't have been obvious. Uh, which one was Jesus and which group was his disciples. At least I think that's a better way to think about it, given the thousands of people who came to Jerusalem for this festival and the hundreds who would have made campsites uh, up on the Mount of Olives. So sorry if that ruins your kind of romantic, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses kind of image of uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But uh, he, he was there with his disciples, and the last thing we saw last time, he woke them for the final time. They had fallen asleep, and he says, get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand, and he knew that Judas was on his way. And so, uh, I'm using the NRSV, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. So this is likely the temple police for the most part, and maybe other hangers-on who joined them, uh, forming a kind of mob. Um, we know that the temple police used clubs, um, and they probably, many people also probably carried swords. We'll talk about the sword thing in a moment. But uh, so they expect resistance is what they expect. They come with clubs and swords because of all the people that are on the Mount of Olives and the possibility of forming a riot. But it is at night. Uh, and so they have a chance to arrest Jesus and, and others if they choose uh, on the Mount of Olives in a, in a secret way. But they expect that there may be resistance from uh, Jesus, from his disciples, from other people who uh, may have been on the Mount of Olives. So uh, now it's, uh, verse 48, the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. Um, so in order to pick out Jesus from the crowds that were there on the Mount of Olives, uh, Judas, uh, had pre-arranged this kiss of betrayal, as it's called, um, uh, an ironic uh, gesture, a gesture of greeting and affection, 
and friendship often. Uh, but here the intention is quite the opposite. Uh, to send Jesus on his way to trial uh, and ultimately to his death. And at once Judas came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. If you remember, uh, during the Last Supper, uh, in verse 25 of this same chapter, Judas uh, was, dur at, during the Last Supper, Judas doesn't say, as the others do, Surely not I, Lord. He doesn't call Jesus Lord. He calls him you guessed it, Rabbi. He's the only disciple who calls Jesus Rabbi. Um, and perhaps this is a sign of his unbelief that Jesus is something more than just a teacher. Um, we obviously don't know the heart and mind of Judas, but we can tell things by what he says and his actions. And he is the only one who calls Jesus Rabbi, even though um, Jesus had encouraged his disciples not to use such titles. And so he kissed him and identified him as the one who uh, should be arrested. Now, uh, the next verse, verse 50, uh, can be translated more than one way. Once Judas greets him and kisses him, Jesus said, and this is the NRSV, friend, do what you are here to do. Um, but it can also be a question. Some of the translations say, uh, friend, what are you here to do? Um, and make it a question. It certainly can read that way. Um, it's hard to know exactly the translation that's appropriate. The Greek is so um, compacted and enigmatic, it, it can be translated more than one way. Um, so here, it gets translated as if it were um, a command, do what you are here to do. Uh, most m Many people choose that option for translation because Jesus knows what Judas has come to do, and so he doesn't need to ask, what is it that you've come here to do? Although that might be uh, a way um, of raising in the mind of Judas the seriousness of what he is about to do, and maybe a way to give him one last time not to do what he has set his mind to do. But do, Jesus says here, what you are here to do. Jesus um, wants the action, once he has committed himself to the will of the Father, thy will be done, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, he wants the action to move forward. Uh, and so they came then the crowd and the temple police come and lay hands on Jesus and arrest him um, in verse 50. But unexpectedly, um, the Greek says, look or behold, and the NRSV translates it as suddenly, one of those with Jesus, not here identified, but in another synoptic gospel passage, uh, or is it John, I forget, uh, identifies this as Peter, uh, and that, that could well be. Matthew chooses perhaps not to identify him further other than just as one of those who were with Jesus. You could even think of it as somebody in the crowd who was with Jesus, but it's probably a disciple, and from another passage it's identified as Peter. And Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, which would have been probably hidden under his cloak, uh, and drew it and struck off the ear of the slave of the high priest. Um, back in Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 38, uh, let's take a look at that. Now hold on to Matthew 26 here and turn over to Luke 22. This is Luke's passion narrative. And uh, in, a, in the passage, uh, starting at verse 35, Luke 22, 35, Jesus said to them, When I sent you out without a purse, a bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, No, not a thing. So even though they didn't have provisions with them, 
the provisions got supplied. God intervened and helped them with whatever they needed and, and did so through people who helped the apostles when they were on their uh, journeys around Galilee and Judea and Samaria. And he said to them, now Jesus says to them, well, you didn't lack a thing, but now the one who has a purse must take it and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was counted among the lawless. And indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. And the disciples then say, Lord, look, here are two swords. So among the twelve of them, they have two swords. Quite a... Uh, an armament, wouldn't you say? Quite an armory of uh, weapons against the Romans and against the temple police. They have two squirt guns, two swords. Okay, they're not squirt guns. They're a little more lethal than squirt guns. But uh, two swords against all, all the opposition that could be raised against Jesus uh, and will be raised suddenly. And he said, he, and he said, Jesus said, it is enough. Now, some translations don't say it is enough. They say enough of that. Uh, that is, that the disciples um, taking Jesus literally, when I don't think he meant to be taken literally here, although there are people who do think he meant that people should sell their cloaks and buy swords. Uh, it's, a it's, it's a metaphor. It's a um, a way of saying things are going to get very serious very soon. Uh, and even though all your needs were provided for before with purse, bag, and sandals and so forth, now things are going to get more serious. So, you know, sell your cloak and buy a sword. Um, and the disciples taking Jesus literally say, we have two swords. And Jesus says in the NRSV, he says, it is enough. Um, but I often thought it was more consistent for Jesus that to be translated as enough of that, enough of taking me literally uh, two swords. What is that against so many? And that fits better with what happens next. When one of Jesus' disciples takes one of those two swords, Peter probably, and cuts off the ear of the closest opponent uh, close to him, Jesus says, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me a lot more than two swords? Uh, a lot more, including twelve legions of angels, thousands and thousands of angels who were uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they were thought of as militant angels, angels who fight against the devil and his enemies um, and, and, God, and fight against God's enemies. And so uh, these militaristic angels were on call, as it were, uh, in the heavenly host. Um, and Jesus has chosen not to call on them, but to do the will of his Father in heaven, as we saw him pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so he says um, that they should put their swords back in their place. Um, and it, that fits better with uh, translating Luke 22, 38, enough of that, uh, rather than it is enough. Um, Jesus also appeals here to the, the fulfilling of Scripture, one of Matthew's uh, prominent themes throughout the whole gospel. He is over and over again, I think 14 or 15 times already, uh, made explicit reference as well as implied references to many, many passages uh, in the Hebrew Bible. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled here, verse 40, 54, which say it must happen in this way? The same way that it said in Luke in verse 22, 37, for I tell you the scripture must be fulfilled in me and he was counted among the lawless. And so they do come to arrest Jesus uh, as if he were uh, among the lawless. Uh, and we get that um, emphasis in Matthew's gospel in a different way from Luke. 
in verse 55. And at that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? That is one of the lawless ones. Um, this bandit idea has political connotations. It's not just a thief like the two thieves on the cross. Um, it, this, is a, this is a revolutionary, as if he were one of the false messiahs who arose in opposition to, to Rome uh, and to the Roman occupation. And there were several in the, in the first century B.C. and A.D. who arose and, and, and claimed to be messiahs. But, uh, but who also um, had soldiers join them and fight in opposition to the Romans. And this is the kind of idea, it has political connotations, not just theft connotations, uh, when we say a bandit. Jesus uh, said, day after day I sat in the temple teaching and there I was and you didn't arrest me there. It's a bit ironic, he knows why they didn't arrest him there, because it would have created a riot in the crowds. Now they can do so under cover of darkness. Um, it's always amazing to me uh, that we humans are more inclined to do evil in the darkness than we are in the light of day. Uh, once it's dark, um, we think we can get away with things that we wouldn't try to get away with during the day. And, and here the soldiers, the temple police are the same way uh, instead of arresting Jesus when it was obvious where he was um, and what he was teaching, they could have done so, but um, the crowds would have raised opposition that they didn't want. And so in the darkness, they can do the evil that they couldn't do in the daylight. But, verse 56, but all this, Jesus said, has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled a second reference in three verses to the fulfillment of Scripture. This was important to Matthew's community, obviously, right? Um, Matthew's community as Christ Jewish Christians are in opposition to other Jews and synagogues in their town, possibly up in Antioch, who uh, were not Christians, and yet both communities appealed to the same textual basis for their faith, for their religion, uh, for their practice. And so Matthew over and over again hammers at home that what has happened in the life, death, and eventually resurrection of Jesus is a fulfillment of that which was foretold, uh, if you could read the Old Testament rightly, uh, was foretold in the scriptures. Uh, the Christians only began to see this after the resurrection of Jesus. Um, as we know from the other Gospels, uh, especially John, John makes the point that they did not know um, what was going on during the life of Jesus uh, as they were with him before his resurrection. But after the resurrection, it's as if they got a new set of glasses through which to read the Hebrew Bible, through which to read what we call the Old Testament. And there they began to see how many things uh, seemed to be fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, another, uh, another prediction of Jesus that's also cited in the Old Testament uh, is now fulfilled at the end of verse 56. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Remember, he said earlier, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Uh, and, and, and that was a prediction that Jesus had cited um, that would be fulfilled uh, as he, the shepherd, is now arrested and all the disciples flee. The next scene that we covered in our study questions was the, uh, the so-called trial. It's not really a trial. It's more of a hearing um, in the home of the the high priest Caiaphas, um, who with some scribes and elders uh, had gathered together there in his home. Uh, and it is not an official trial as such, but it functions that way uh, before they hand Jesus over to Pilate. They want to find sufficient charges against him so that they can uh, offer 
Jesus to the Romans for capital punishment. Uh, and so they, they meet together in the home of Caiaphas. Um, Matthew uh, gives us a little foretaste of what we're going to study next week, the, the Peter's denial of Jesus. And he says in verse 58, there was Peter following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. That is, he went inside the home area of the high priest into the courtyard that would have been surrounded by the home. This is the typical pattern of an indoor, open to the sky courtyard surrounded by the building in which um, this wealthy high priest would have lived. So Peter, still intending to carry out his bravado that uh, even though the rest of them desert you, I will not. Um, he, is, he is at least following at a distance. Even though all the disciples deserted him and fled, Peter uh, keeps track of what is happening to Jesus and follows him at a distance in order to see how this would end. Isn't that an amazing statement? Uh, it gives a motivation to Peter. Uh, perhaps he hoped that things would not turn out the way they did, but it is a kind of ominous verse. Matthew knows well how it's all going to end, and so he has Peter being motivated by sitting with the guards uh, at the fire in the courtyard, warming his hands, as we know from other the other Gospels, in order to see how this would end. Now, the, count, the chief priests and the whole council, um, perhaps representatives of the whole council, uh, were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. Uh, false from Matthew's point of view and the Christian community's point of view, um, not probably from the point of view of the high priest, although any testimony that was against Jesus probably would be good. There, um, they're not seeking the truth so much as they are seeking what they already want and have already determined to bring about by paying Judas a, a price of 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. They're looking for testimony that would allow them to turn Jesus over to Pilate and the Romans in order to put Jesus to death. But they found none. Verse 60 though many false witnesses came forward, but you have to have two witnesses who say the same thing. Even though many came forward, but at last two witnesses did come forward, verse 60 and 61, and they say, this fellow, isn't that an interesting way to describe Jesus? This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now, as I remember, we don't have that saying as such in the Gospel of Matthew. We have Jesus uh, predicting the destruction of the temple, but the saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, is in the Gospel of John. It's not in the Gospel of Matthew. But here it is in at least a form very close to that, John saying, that Johannine saying, in these witnesses who said that Jesus said, I am able to, in Mark it says, I will, uh, Matthew has softened that a bit, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Well, by the time Matthew writes this, the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed as Jesus predicted. Um, and so there is a grain of truth, isn't there, in, uh, in the, this accusation against Jesus, even though in John it says he was not referring to the Herodian temple, that huge complex that the Romans uh, utterly destroyed in 70 AD, long after this trial scene, but after the, or before the Gospel of Matthew was written. Uh, he was referring to the temple of his body, that if it were destroyed, it would be raised in three days. So uh, that accusation is made against him and the high priest stood up. He now has what he's looking for, he thinks, um, a, a saying against the temple. Uh, 
that would have been considered to be the place of God's dwelling and therefore possibly a, a, a crime deserving of capital punishment. The, pray, the high priest stands up and says to Jesus, have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Um, it says in the old King James Version in Isaiah, uh, as, as the lamb before its slaughterers is silent, so he opened not his mouth, referring to the Isaiah suffering servant and the silence of, of the suffering servant before, uh, before the uh, ones who were to kill him. And so Jesus here is silent. And that likely is a reflection of the passage in the Old Testament. Then the high priest said to him, he'd given that Jesus made no reply, I put you under oath before the living God. In other words, he is asking Jesus to swear by the living God to tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. The irony here, of course, is that back in chapter 16, uh, these are the very words Jesus' disciple Peter used to confess him as the Messiah. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And here, the same thing is being asked by one who doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah. It, he's in effect saying, do you really think you are the Messiah, the Son of God? Uh, and Jesus said to him, uh, you have said so. Uh, that, is, that is, as you look at the other places where that uh, expression is used, you have said so. It was said something like that to Judas when he said, Rabbi, uh, is it I? And Jesus said, you have said it. Uh, it's an agreement, a uh, statement of agreement, but it's a way of saying the statement of agreement that puts it on the lips of the person who asked the question. You have said so. But now Jesus goes on to say, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. The word power here is a, a circumlocution for God rather than using the divine name. You will see the Son of Man, the way Jesus has most often re referred to himself, seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Here, uh, Matthew has put these words on the lips of Jesus, uh, claiming to be the, the Daniel son of man. You'll need to go back to Daniel again if you haven't recently and look at chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, when the son of man, one like a son of man, comes on the clouds of heaven and to him is given rule and dominion and authority over all the nations. Um, and here Jesus is claiming to be that Danielic son of man. For the high priest, this constitutes blasphemy. And so he says he is blasphemed. We don't need any more witnesses. We've already had two that said he's going to destroy the temple. And now he has claimed to be uh, too close to God, to be sitting at the right hand of God, the right hand of power. Um, and, and so for the high priest's point of view, that is sufficient testimony from Jesus himself and from these two witnesses that they've had. And so he asked the council for their verdict and they say he deserves death. And then they mock him and spit at him and strike him. This is also going to take place by the Roman soldiers later on, but it begins with this first set of opponents uh, the leadership of the temple who turned Jesus over to be killed. And so they end this section by saying, uh, prophesy to us, you false Messiah, who was it that struck you? Clearly, they don't believe that Jesus is who Matthew's, Matthew has confessed Jesus to be as the Christ, the son of the living God. But, but the story will continue next week as we pick up Peter's denial and the trial before Pilate. Well, I will um, be sending out study questions on that section later on this week. Um, this is, these events are so dramatic. Um, make sure that you're reading the text itself and following up with your study in the commentary. Uh, God bless you and have a wonderful week.
Take care.